Uh, thank you very much. That's some introduction. Actually, I'm really just here to ruin your lunch. Um, that is the job of dietitians everywhere. Um, we are gonna, I'm going to take you through a little bit on managing mood with food. I know when we were setting up and deciding what topic I'd cover today, we were saying well, we talk about diet and cancer and all those kind of things, and we thought, no, we'll, we'll do something a bit fun today. So this is something that's not just for people who've experienced cancer, but for family, everybody around it, because I think it, 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 it spreads its wings, I think, when it happens, and mood is a, is a factor for everybody. So we're going to start off, very, very basic thing. You are what you eat. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. I want you to take a minute though and think about it because you are literally built out of the food that you eat. So everything about you, whether you're looking at skin or hair or you're heading inside, you're looking at liver, kidneys, all of that, that is made out of what you ate yesterday, last week, last month, because your body is constantly updating. Have you ever heard that you get new skin every 28 days? new bones every seven years. <laughs> every single bit of muscle on your body is replaced every 100 days. Okay, So by next February, there will be not be one bit of muscle on your body that's here today. And the muscle there in February is going to be made out of what you've been eating over the next three months, and that includes Christmas. Okay. <laughs> so with that in mind, whatever you had for breakfast this morning is going to show up on your face in 28 days' time. So. <laughs> We're going to, getting the basics right, I'm not giving you a sort of a full healthy eating lecture. I'm just going to very quickly touch on the basic food groups. I'm sure you know them. Starchy foods, fruit and veg, dairy, protein foods and fats. What's important here is that you need something from each group every day. Okay? When it comes to nutrition, you've got people who've actually studied it, and then you have whatever celebrity went on a diet last week, and this week it's don't eat dairy or gluten or fat or whatever is going on. I don't know. Just be really careful about jumping on the bandwagon with that, because if you do cut out whole food groups, it is very difficult to pick up the same nutrition from the other foods. So unless you have a really good medical reason for it or a proper allergy test or something like that, don't just randomly cut out whole food groups with it. All okay in that? Grant? So we're going to jump in and have a look at some of the vitamins and minerals that have an impact on our mood. The first and probably the biggest one is iron. And I think we hear so much about this that we nearly forget that it's important. Being low in iron, though, has big impacts on our mood. Its biggest one is that it, it directly affects our energy. And when you have low energy, it's very hard to do anything. So we get low energy when the iron go, goes down. We get poor concentration, so our ability to focus on things. Even our motivation tends to go down with it. What's really funny is your IQ actually drops when your iron goes down as well. And when you get your iron back, it actually goes back up again, OK? This is really interesting because 48% of women in Ireland don't eat enough iron, which is come on. I often think the teenage girls that kind of do really, really well in the leaving cert, I think we, we cover the guys, do we do a lot better? Imagine if all those girls actually ate enough iron as well. Um, so we need iron. Iron's job is really to carry oxygen around the body. Okay? Every cell in your body needs oxygen. If you don't get iron to carry that around, your cells can't make any energy and you are just not going to feel as well as you could. So iron is important. Now, you all know iron is important, don't you? Yep, and yet one in two of you is not eating enough. So why not? Where are the foods that we're going to get iron from? So I'm sure you all know red meat gives you iron, did you? Okay. Um, it does, and we've heard a lot about red meat and cancer over the years, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about that. Did you all of you see the report last week saying that was it, red meat, gone forever? I know. Don't you love how headlines just take everything and go crazy with it? Did you see the one last year that said that uh, chocolate cures diabetes? <laughs> that was in the Daily Mail. That was my favourite for 2014. Sadly, not true. Um, Okay, with red meat, we do need it for iron, and, but there is, as I said, there was a report last week about cancer. So, to clear it up, if you take a piece of red meat on its own, it's actually okay, right? The problem is if you process it. So if you were to take pork, that's fine, but if you turn it into bacon or ham, the processing of that, the salt that's added and the chemicals that are added, that's where the cancer risk is, okay? So they're the problem, and there's definitely a link between processed meat and cancer. In terms of just plain ordinary red meat, there's very little evidence that that's linked with cancer unless you burn it. Have you ever had the experience at a barbecue of having a completely cremated steak? Okay, you know the crunchy black bits you get on that? They are extremely carcinogenic, okay? They're worse than cigarettes, don't eat them, right? But if you take red meat and you don't process it and you don't burn it, actually it's fine. So a stew is going to be good because you're not going to burn the meat. Um, spaghetti bolognese, things like that where you're getting the red meat in but you haven't done anything particularly bad with it. In saying that, you don't need to rush out and start eating steak every day for the rest of your life, even if you could afford it. Um, what you do need to do though is get it in two to three times a week. 
and particularly for women that's something to think about. Men tend to be much much better at doing this. The second place to go and get your iron is poultry, so things like chicken and turkey, but the iron here is all in the legs. There's actually almost no iron in chicken breast, all right? To put it in perspective, okay, just to give you an idea, to get all the iron you need, you would have to eat more than 20 chicken breasts a day, okay? <laughs> so, don't eat, chicken leg now has the iron. The same with fish, if you look at fish, white fish has almost, there's actually three times more iron in carrots than there is in white fish, okay? So the oily fish have the, the iron, so you're looking at things like salmon, mackerel is really good for iron, sardines, if you like them, are really, really high in iron, and they're actually rich in calcium as well, so they're fantastic. Shellfish is brilliant. Mussels have more iron in them than beef, so they're actually a great, great place to go and get it. And then eggs are gonna give you some iron as well. On the vegetable side, the green leafy vegetables that we've all heard about, cabbage, does cabbage have iron in it? It does if you eat the dark green leaves, but if you take your cabbage and you hack off all the green stuff and just eat the yellow bit, you've thrown all the iron in the bin, okay? So you need to get those out of the bin, wash them, put them into a stir fry, put them into soups where you blend them or you know, make stock out of them so you actually get the iron from it. You know kale that's been very fashionable recently? Actually really good for iron, okay? Really, really good, but just chew it well to actually get the iron out of it. Um, and then spinach is great. So if you're making salads, if you use maybe spinach instead of lettuce, you have a huge amount of extra iron in, gone into what you're eating. Beans and lentils then are another fabulous place to get, and especially if you're vegetarian, but even if you're not, chickpeas are very rich in iron. So if you have a, a bean salad or things like that, they're gonna be fantastic. And you know lentils that we used to all throw into soups and stew years ago? They're very rich in iron. What gives them their color is the iron. So if you, you know barley as well? You know the soup mix? I was going to say your mother probably used it, but I'm sure plenty of you here are still familiar with it. The barley, the lentils in that, if you're making soups or stews or casserole, you throw a few handfuls of that in, you're adding huge amounts of iron with that, okay? Now, we need to be getting 14 milligrams of iron a day. If you go home and have a steak tonight, you will get six milligrams of iron, okay? So just having one a day from that's not going to do it. I want you to have a look at that list. You need two foods a day from that list, okay? So get going on that. Do you see now why you're all really low in iron? Imagine the energy you're going to have now in about six weeks' time. You'll be bouncing off the walls. Okay, the next one we're going to look at then is vitamin D. Um, vitamin D does a lot actually in the body. Um, really boosts calcium absorption. It reduces the risk of an awful lot of cancers. We see it involved a lot in the immune system and particularly in the part of the immune system that deals with cancer. But also has a role in depression. So when we look at countries where people have high levels of vitamin D, they have much lower rates of depression. And likewise, if you go to a country like Ireland where we have low levels of vitamin D, we see a lot more depression. Now, I just wonder if the people with the high vitamin D are all living in sunny countries and maybe it's just the weather. Um, the big problem with vitamin D is that we're supposed to get it from the sun. Okay, not exactly famous for our sunny weather in Ireland. So we rely on getting it from food and it's very hard to get it. There's not a lot of vitamin D in foods. If you read up about this, you'll hear people talking about oil-rich fish for vitamin D and eggs, but you'd actually need to eat 35 eggs a week to get the vitamin D that you need, okay? I'm not recommending that you eat 35 eggs a week. What I would say to you is you need to go and get a supplement, okay? Don't mess around with this. Go into the chemist, get a decent vitamin D supplement. Cod liver oil is a good place to get it. Um, or you know the super milk? They're brilliant. Those fortified milks are great, and it actually gets everybody in the house onto the vitamin D as well, so you dose everyone. 80% um, of people in Ireland are vitamin D deficient, so this is a key one for us to actually bring in. The next one we're going to look at then are the omega-3 fats. I'm sure you've all heard of these, have you? I noticed Whiskas started putting them in the cat food, and I thought, you know, if the cats are getting it, it's official. Um, <laughs> Now, we know there's huge benefits to omega-3s, particularly the type that comes from fish. People who eat a lot of fish get a lot less heart disease, they get less bowel cancer, men get less prostate cancer, but it's into the brain where this actually really becomes important. Do you know your brain is mostly made out of fat? Some of you. Have you ever seen pictures of the brain? The other way it's kind of grey and lumpy, right? Most of the grey stuff you're looking at there is actually fat, but most of the fat in your brain is very specifically omega-3. Now, to be honest, the crucial time for your brains was back while your mother was pregnant with you. Okay? You make 75% of your brain cells before you're born. The other 25% then are in place by the time you're one year old. Okay? Would you believe you have your full-sized adult brain by the time you're three? If you look at a three-year-old, the next chance you get to see how their head is massively out of proportion to their body. They will. They look really weird when you really look at them. So we have these big, big heads on small children. But the point is that after that, you've got to keep topping up the omega-3s in your diet so that you keep your brain healthy. Do you remember I said at the start that your body updates all the time? 
Okay, well, if your brain needs to re replace a brain cell today, have you eaten any omega-3s recently to allow that to happen? There's a scary thought, isn't it? Because if the brain, if you haven't, what does it do? Well, when we look at people with things like Alzheimer's, they have much lower levels of omega-3s in their brains compared to people who don't. And if you eat a lot of fish or you take fish oils, your chances of getting things like Alzheimer's or dementia goes down by almost 45%. Okay? Um, but forget even about Alzheimer's and dementia. That's just to talk about the importance of the brain. It has an impact on how you feel. And we know from huge studies looking at children, teenagers, adults, that people who are really very low, and particularly fish oils for years, they get a lot more anxiety, they get a lot more depression. And if it's extreme, if you have someone who's been very, very low in omega-3s, literally from birth, they tend to get, be a lot more aggressive, actually, in their behavior. And what's interesting is it's reversible. Where I would see it as a, sort of working in clinics is where people have gone on a fat-free diet, it used to be very popular a while ago. Thankfully, they're not so fashionable anymore. But if someone was fat-free for more than a year, they would have huge anxiety and panic attacks. Um, it's a major symptom of it. So you need to have these special fats coming in. And the best place to get them is the oil-rich fish. Now, you're looking, your white fish, you know your cod, your haddock, they do have a little omega-3, but it's not a huge amount. So it's brilliant if you can also bring in things like salmon, trout, mackerel, herring, sardines, all of these type of fish as well. Now, it doesn't matter what you do to them, whether they're fresh, frozen, tinned, fried, smoked, they keep the omega-3s, okay? The only exception is tuna. Tinned tuna doesn't have omega-3s, but tinned salmon, tinned sardines, they do, so they're gonna be fabulous to go for. Now, you will also hear people talk about omega-3s in nuts and seeds, but just be careful here because the type of omega-3 that you get in nuts and seeds is different to the type that you get in fat, or in fish, sorry. So, and unfortunately, they're not as useful. Now, up to about 10 years ago, they did think all omega-3s were equal and it didn't matter, but we now know that, very specifically, it needs to be the fish type of omega-3s for the effects on mood and the effect on brain. So either you've got to start eating the fish, or if you completely hate fish, I do classes on adult fussy eating, we'll get you over it. Or you can take the fish oil supplements and that's going to bring you through. Okay. Um, one of the other things to have a look at then is one that we don't tend to think a lot about, which is carbohydrate or starchy foods. Okay. Would you have thought these were related to your mood? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. I love room full of comfort eaters, have I? <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things like if you've ever had a bad day, you don't go home going, I've had a bad day, I'm going home for a salad. What do you go home for? Chips, Chips chocolate. <laughs> Come on, pasta, bread, sweets, that's what we go for. We go for carbohydrate. Why? Experts actually call this self-medication, right? Where your body, with, without you really knowing, it's actually going for the thing that's going to help you. And carbohydrates are interesting because you have a little receptor in your brain that when you eat carbohydrates, it's triggered and it makes you feel relaxed. If any of you have had babies or you've fed babies, you know they could be squalling and screaming, but if you get some milk into them, they, you can really see the tension come out of them. And it's the, that effect on babies. So we're gonna look for that effect. Now, I'm not suggesting you rush out and live on chips and chocolate and crisps, unfortunately. Um, but just be careful because it's quite fashionable at the moment for people to cut carbohydrate out altogether. You know, these high protein diets that are knocking around. So I would include your carbs. We'll talk about sensible portions, but what you just need to do is keep them in there and very specifically go for your whole grain kinds, okay? Whole grain versions, not only are they going to give you the nice healthy carbohydrate, but they're going to give you some lovely B vitamins and they also help. We know that there's a big reduction in cancer where you're taking your whole grains. But the other thing you're going to pick up here is fiber. And probably in a million years, you've not linked fiber with mood, have you? Unless you've ever suffered from severe constipation, you've never realized how important fiber actually is for how you feel. Um, but fiber has an interesting effect on mood and it comes back down to the overall health of your digestive system. Have you ever heard of a thing called serotonin? Yes. Okay, serotonin is our happy hormone. This is what makes us feel really good, okay? Um, and very often with depression, the reason some people have depression is they just don't make as much serotonin as somebody else. So a bit like someone with diabetes doesn't make enough insulin, someone with depression very often just doesn't make enough serotonin. Um, and serotonin, a lot of the research around it is focused in on the brain and the brain making serotonin. But about 15 years ago, a young researcher noticed actually that the gut is making serotonin. And they got curious about this and they really investigated and they found that 80% of the serotonin in your body is actually made in your digestive system. So your digestive system has a bigger impact on mood in terms of serotonin than even your brain. So it's to shift the focus just a little bit and to what we call sort of a gut-brain link. 
and keeping the gut healthy we know keeps everything working a whole lot better but just gets the mood up a little bit more. So what do we need to do? This is where fibre comes in and we need fibre to keep digestion healthy. The big problem with fibre though is that almost 80% of people in Ireland do not eat enough fibre. What I find though is when I talk to people about this, everybody thinks they do. Okay. Did you think you were eating enough fibre up to about two minutes ago? Yeah, yeah you're all changing your mind now, aren't you? Okay. Um, fibre is so important. I mean, we talk about it in terms of mood, but fibre helps reduce um, a whole, like cancer and heart disease. It helps to keep weight healthy. It's actually the number one thing you do if you want to lose weight is go on a high fibre diet. It's the place you start, no matter how much weight you have to lose. Um, but really important for a healthy bowel. Now, you've all heard of fibre, haven't you? Right, it's not like I'm turning up today to go, do you know what we just discovered, right? And yet 80% of us don't make it. Why? Did anyone go for a high fibre cereal for breakfast this morning? Yeah, what did you go for? Usually porridge. Many people had porridge. Yeah, it's usually about a third of the room. Wheatabix as well. So we say we'll start with muesli, porridge and Wheatabix. Okay, you need 25 grams of fibre a day, okay? Now, if you had to take a guess, how much fibre do you get out of a bowl of porridge? 10, 8? Go with 10. Who's going for 10? Who's going for 10 or more? You're all terrified. I'm not actually going to put you on detention if you get this wrong, okay? <laughs> okay, less than 10. The rest of you. Would you believe it's only 3? So 3 grams of fibre in a bowl of porridge. If you have two Wheatabix, that's 4. Bowl of muesli? Depending on the brand, it's 4 to 6 grams, okay? What if you had cornflakes for breakfast? Yeah, it's about half a gram. Someone did ask me recently would they be better off eating the cardboard. Um, <laughs> no is the answer to that, but um, not a lot of fibre. And I think what happens to a lot of us with fibre is we tend to get up in the morning and sort of have cereal. And we sort of think, great, that's it. That's my fibre now sorted out for the day. But you can see from this that that's not the case. So if you're going to actually get the fibre you need for the day, you have to be thinking about fibre at lunch and dinner as well as at breakfast. So the high fibre cereal in the morning is a brilliant start. But then you also need the brown bread at lunchtime and the jacket potato at dinner where you eat the skins. Okay? Fruit and veg will give you some fibre, but again, not a huge amount. If you eat a piece of fruit or a serving of veg, you are getting two grams of fibre from that. Okay? So that's why we talk about eating lots of fruit and veg every day. Um, you know this fashion for putting seeds into everything? Yes. One of the better trends going out there, the seeds are fantastic. They're really good for minerals, but they're very high in fiber. And if you put two dessert spoons of seeds into your cereal in the morning, you're gonna add about six grams of fiber by doing that. So if you had your porridge, you had a bit of fruit, you had some seeds in there, you're hitting 12 grams, so you're nearly halfway. Okay, so it's just about bringing it in a little bit more through the rest of the day. Um, the one thing I would say is don't go out and eat all of that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> just, it takes about two to three weeks to build up and how do you know you're eating enough fibre? Yeah, it's not a trick question, okay? Um, I'm going to touch on this just a little bit because you'd be amazed what people don't know about their own digestion. Um, I worked with a young guy years ago and he came in to me because he was very underweight despite eating lots and lots of food and his doctor had checked him out and nobody could find anything, came in to me and I'm going through it and eventually get to the famous dietitian question, which is like, how are your bowels? So he says to me, he goes, they're fantastic. He said, I go 15 times a day. No one had ever told him that wasn't normal. He didn't know. So it turned out he was severely lactose intolerant. So that was what was going on with him. But for the rest of us, what's normal? What's healthy? So healthy is going once to twice a day. Okay, not once to twice a week, once to twice a day. It should come out with no effort. If you're really strained and go to the loo, you are not eating enough fibre. And it should look like a crack sausage, and I'm going to leave you with that lovely visual, and we're going to come, <laughs> we're going to, come to the end. So in terms of key mood foods and nutrients, just to flash back, because we're going to do the exam at about 2 o'clock. So iron is the big one. Where are we getting iron? Two really good foods. Red meat and... Green vegetables, fantastic. Vitamin D, what are you going to do for that? Supplement. Going to get a supplement. Fish and fish oils. Supplement. supplement or eat it. I would say if you can eat the fish twice a week, you don't need to also spend money on the supplements because they're not cheap. Okay, but the oil-rich fish, if you can do that twice a week, we'll cover you. Fibre, what are we doing for fibre? Breakfast, we're going to have? Cereal. Lunch, we're going to have? Seeds and brown bread. Dinner, we're going to have? Veg and jacket potatoes. We are sorted. I would say, though, 
wide variety of foods. I could talk on food and mood for about three solid days, okay? You would pass out by the end of it, but we could do it. Um, but wide variety of foods, don't cut anything out. It is such a temptation to cut out whole food groups. If you're cutting out a whole food group, go and talk to a qualified dietitian and make sure you're not missing out on something important. And finally, enjoy your food. And I can see they're starting to wheel lunch in here, so I hope you really enjoy it, and thank you very much. Thank you.